Um, it's, it's really good to be here. Um, I'm, uh, I was particularly uh, intrigued by the name of this conference um, because it's something I've thought about a lot. Um, so today I'm going to just give a kind of set of very tentative thoughts, um, which are you know, in no way a, a sort of a fully worked out uh, academic paper. Um, but there's some of the reflections that I have um, partly based on my academic research, but substantially based on my sort of personal experience uh, working uh, for a regulator in the UK. Um, so this, this conference, the title is very intriguing, Governance of and by Algorithms. Um, so I, I really was interested when, when, I, when I saw the title of this conference because um, I think it's, it raises lots of interesting questions about these, this of and by construction. So if we start off by thinking about governance by algorithm. So governance here we could interpret in a broad sense as coordination between actors on the basis of rules. Um, that's Katzenbach and Ulbricht's uh, uh, definition. Or we could think about algorithmic regulation, um, similarly broadly defined by Karen Young as intentional attempts to manage risk um, or alter behavior in order to achieve some pre-specified goal. Um, these definitions encompass quite a whole, a, a, a wide range of different phenomena, um, and they've been used to describe a sort of general ubiquitous mode of emergent governance that's, that's taking place um, at a global level, um, a kind of uh, what we might think of as an algorithmic leviathan. So the algorithms are uh, setting up and enforcing the rules that we all have to live by. Um, so there's kind of this sense of a, a sort of Hobbesian leviathan. Um, by contrast, the notion of um, governance of algorithms is perhaps what um, is the, the current discourse is mostly uh, focused on in, in the legal sphere. So we're talking here about regulation of uh, mostly you know, large firms or, or government actors who are using algorithms to do the stuff that they do um, and how we can, uh, as a society, as stakeholders, as a demos, but specifically also as regulators, how can we uh, govern these algorithms um, and whether these algorithms are based on AI, machine learning, or just good old fashioned uh, rule-based systems. They're having a greater impact on our uh, economies, on our social and private lives. So how can we think about the application of things like fundamental rights, like equality, privacy, data protection to the use of AI by governments and private sector actors? So as I said, I'm going to be drawing from my experience uh, working at the Information Commissioner's Office. So this is the UK's data protection regulator. Um, so the, so the, the ICO has um, historically um, had quite a strong focus on AI, big data and machine learning. Um, while I was there, one of the things I was working on was a uh, framework for regulating artificial intelligence. So this was both a methodology for the ICO to assess data protection compliance with AI systems, um, but also supporting uh, people within the regulator to uh, have the right knowledge, capabilities, and so on to support the work of the ICO. Um, and as well as providing external guidance for organizations on how to address data protection risks in AI systems. Um, so while I was working at the ICO, uh, various other regulators in the UK, um, such as Ofcom, the uh, communications regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority, the Consumer and Markets Authority, um, and the, the Bank of England, were all also looking into how to uh, deal with the new challenges that were being raised by the use of algorithms and AI in the, uh, the sectors that they regulate. Um, this, um, this sort of culminated um, in the newly set up uh, uh, Digital uh, Regulation Cooperation Forum. Um, and within that, there's an AI and data science regulatory capacity working group whose uh, role is to coordinate between different regulators um, to combine knowledge and uh, skills and, and even resources to undertake um, you know, the, the, the uh, challenges that they face when it comes to regulating AI. Um, so this kind of raised a, a few distinct questions for regulators. So first of all, what do regulators expect from regulatees? So regulated entities who are using AI, you know, what do regulators expect from them? And so obviously that's gonna differ depending on the different uh, 
sort of substantive regulatory compliance questions which will differ between different regulators. There are also um, cross-cutting principles, so uh, things like uh, explainability, transparency, robustness, principles that, uh, that different regulators could agree on, even if the sort of details of their regulatory remit differ. Second question is, is what skills, resources and tools do regulators need to regulate algorithms? Um, and finally, how might regulators in fact use algorithms themselves in their own work? Um, so question one is a, is a big topic. Um, it's something that uh, there's a lot of literature on. Other legal scholars, um, many, some of them whom are here today, have plenty of interesting things to say about this. And I have made my own small contribution to this space as well. Um, question two is perhaps one that's received a bit less attention. Um, and question three, similarly. And so I'd like to focus on questions two and three today. Um, so we have this kind of standard model of regulation where there's a regulator, there are several uh, regulated entities, each of whom develop their own, uh, their own uh, algorithms for deployment in their own contexts. Um, and maybe the regulator um, issues some codes or guidance or rules um, that these regulatees can, uh, can read and work out how they apply to the use of AI in their own context. And maybe they produce a set of uh, internal policies that allow, enable them to implement uh, the regulator's guidance internally. Um, and so this, this model, uh, you know, it's, it seems to kind of uh, capture the, the, one of the dominant forms, I suppose, of, of regulating AI. Um, and, you know, it's, it, when, when, when it works well, it, it could work very well. We have a regulator that's well resourced, a limited number of regulatees, um, and, uh, you know, sort of um, hopefully uh, the ability to take the codes or guidance or rules and implement them themselves. Um, so it sounds simple, um, but um, unfortunately, my friends, das ist gar nicht so einfach. It's not so simple. There are a number of problems that arise in this uh, in this model, uh, which I'm going to um, kind of go through. So the first um, problem is that uh, in many cases the the actual implementation details of the algorithms are hidden behind the policies and the principles that, are, um, that the regulators create. So what you're doing as a, as a regulator is not really interacting with the people who are making the decisions on the ground, the engineers, the product managers who are deciding how to implement the algorithms um, in practice. You're dealing with the compliance people, the lawyers, um, who even, even when participating in good faith uh, are less close to the details. Um, and so that's, that's one of the issues. Um, firms being reluctant to bring their technologists into the conversation alongside their legal and compliance teams with, uh, with the regulator. Another problem is that um, these algorithmic systems that the regulators are using typically are not developed in-house. They're actually outsourced to global technology firms who may not be directly within the regulator's purview. So the regulator is interfacing with the regulators and getting lots of detail about their policies and principles um, but the actual algorithms that the uh, regulators are using are outsourced um, and are out of sight of the regulator. Final problem, related problem, is that um, regulators are facing uh, uh, an unequal um, playing field when it comes to the uh, entities that they regulate. There's an inequality of arms in terms of uh, expertise and resources between the regulators and the more powerful regulatees whose activity is most in need of regulation. Um, so we have a kind of uh, David and Goliath situation. Uh, the plucky David, the regulator, is attempting to rein in the power of these regulatees. And all he has is a, a puny slingshot and a loincloth covering his scrawny body, offering no protection in case of uh, the battles to come with, with these powerful regulated entities. And this inequality is, is kind of uh, present at different levels. So the simplest one is budget. Even the most well-resourced regulators may lack the budget to hire enough staff to pay the legal costs of appeals. So they get tied up in, uh, in enforcement appeals, which 
burn substantial risk, uh, substantial uh, holes in their operating budgets. Uh, you can compare this to the the, uh, the big tech firms, the big banks who have legal budgets in the billions and who spend millions on lobbying every year. Another inequality in the context of regulating algorithms, particularly, is in the level of technical expertise on the regulator side. So uh, a study by um, the browser vendor Brave uh, last year, um, they studied um, the data protection authorities of EU member states, and they found that um, 22 out of 28 of them had fewer than 10 technologists working for them. Uh, and nearly a third of them were actually working for the German lander. So you guys are doing pretty good, um, but the rest of Europe's lagging behind. Um, meanwhile, the firms that are being regulated have armies of technologists who understand how the algorithms work, um, and the regulator is left having to take their word for it a lot of the time. Um, and so um, this creates a real problem for the regulators when they're trying to do things like assess necessity and proportionality. So their lawyers understand well how these balancing tests work. Um, so that can, that can often uh, mean they're well equipped to answer questions about proportionality, but they're not always well equipped to answer questions about necessity. So whether, whether the same purpose could be achieved in a different way, a different algorithm could be designed or a different system other than an algorithm could be used, which interferes less with fundamental rights. That's in part a technical question. And so when the optimization process is algorithmic, how do you make an assessment about that algorithm? Um, and this requires people with technology expertise to unpack the complex ways that algorithms work and their consequences for affected individuals. Uh, this doesn't mean that regulators need to hire, uh, you know, superstar um, AI big names and um, uh, academics or engineers. Um, what they need is people who can cut through the hype that is often surrounding these technologies, um, people who can ask simple questions, but crucial questions, um, and can sniff out when the answers are attempts at technical obfuscation or whether they're genuine challenges that the, that the regulator faces. Um, so this came up in context of uh, trying to understand uh, uh, the error rates of an ML system. Um, so uh, firms were very happy to send uh, um, lawyers and compliance people and government affairs people to talk to regulators for hours, hours at, on, at a time uh, about their high level ethics principles, about their approach to compliance. Um, but they were unable to answer very simple questions about what's the error rate for this system. Um, and so that, that kind of question is really quite important for regulators to understand. Um, but at the moment, there's a sort of uh, an issue with, um, you know, the, the resources on either side. So putting aside this equality of arms question, um, what other things might regulators need um, to, to regulate algorithms effectively? Um, so a major area in this, in a major sort of um, consideration in this area is the ability to inspect algorithms. Um, so inspections here could be black box in the sense that they involve inspecting algorithms from the outside, trying out different combinations of inputs and seeing what outputs we get, possibly simulating the behavior of users under realistic conditions. They could be white box in the sense that the regulator actually gets to look inside uh, the system, look at the source code, look inside the guts of the algorithmic process, the socio-technical processes, and the organizational procedures, and that may be useful in different circumstances. Um, so we're looking here at things like the ability to do compulsory audits and inspections, access documentation, data sets, source code, interview firsthand uh, different personnel, um, as well as the power to, in some cases, engage third-party expertise. Um, so engaging um, you know, other independent assessors in these processes of inspection. Um, there's a lot more to be said about inspection, but I won't go into much detail here. Uh, I can recommend several really good reports from the Ada Lovelace Institute in the UK, as well as a lot of other academic literature. Um, there is one question that often gets raised in the context of um, inspection, and that's uh, the question of, okay, maybe you've inspected an algorithmic process, in some particular context under particular conditions, but um, the, at least the way these systems are often described in the marketing material is that they're constantly changing. They're, they're dynamic, they're adapting, they're taking in new training data all the time. And so 
you might wonder, well, aren't they kind of like a river? They're always changing. Um, and so you, the Heraclitus uh, saying that man never steps in the same river twice. Uh, we're, we're facing maybe a situation where a regulator can never inspect the same algorithm twice because it's always changing. So this dynamic nature of algorithms uh, might appear to make them difficult to assess. So they never stay fixed long enough to be probably properly subjected to scrutiny. Um, and so when a complaint is made about an algorithm, how would we be able to recreate the conditions that led to the output in question? Now, um, personally, I don't think this is necessarily a huge problem. Um, software engineers already use standard uh, version control tools. Um, for algorithms that are not based on machine learning, these standard tools should work just fine. For systems that are based on machine learning, there are increasingly tools available which can be extended to work with these machine learning systems. So forms of version control for machine learning are being developed um, at the moment. Similarly, we have proposals like uh, data sheets for data sets. So these uh, essentially are a standardized format for describing how a data set was obtained. Um, and so that is a kind of key component of, of data set version control and systems that are trained on these data sets, then uh, it's easier to trace where the data came from. Um, and sort of key information about the data. Similarly, model cards, this proposal is a sort of standardized way of um, describing sort of basic features of a model um, such that uh, that information is, is kind of easy to digest and um, it enables us to uh, look at differences between different models and models as they evolve over time. Um, similarly, there are um, tools that exist to maintain logs of all of the sort of inputs to a decision. Um, so we can log all of the decisions that are made or informed by an ML model, uh, the inputs that are used, the version of the model that was used to derive the particular output and other key information. Um, so this is examples from decision provenance and uh, another um, project looking at uh, provenance of algorithmic decisions. So I think all of these tools su suggest that this is uh, this, you know, algorithms being dynamic and changing is less an inherent problem of algorithms and more a question of ensuring that we have standards of um, diligent documentation and archiving that are applied to algorithmic decision-making models. Um, the same level that would be expected for you know, any kind of significant uh, record within an organization. Um, that said, I think there are some uh, cases where um, uh, the traditional methods of version controlling software and data sets and so on may not work. So in computer science, we have kind of two ways of, um, of giving ourselves confidence that a program will behave in the way we want it to. So the, the, the most common one is testing. So we evaluate the system as it behaves in a range of different conditions and we observe its behavior. Um, we don't test every single condition, but we test the sort of major conditions and we see what happens. And if it performs in the way we want to, then we assume that it's going to keep doing so um, in, in new conditions that we haven't tested. Um, verification is a more complex, more sophisticated technique, which gives us a proof that the system will not misbehave in a defined range of possible circumstances, including circumstances that we haven't tested for before. Um, now, while there are means of verification of normal programs, um, when it comes to machine learning systems, um, the, the ability to verify them, verify things like safety, um, is uh, much more limited. Um, the very nature of these systems is that they're trained on a, a training data that comes from a distribution. We can test the model on new test data drawn from the same distribution, but in practice, we can't uh, make guarantees about all of the different possible inputs that that, program, that, that model might receive. Um, and if we could, that could be very good for regulatory purposes. Um, but at the moment, we're still at the very sort of nascency of uh, understanding whether it's even possible to verify the operation of, of ML systems. Um, now, you, so all of these different tools, I think, um, do suggest that we have strong methods already to solve the version control problem. Um, so. But that's all assuming that the regulatee operates these systems internally and does so in an honest and faithful way. Um, and you might think, well, that's a pretty reasonable assumption, right? Most 
it would be, be very rare for an organization to um, provide completely fake uh, fake data or to um, put one reg put, put one algorithm up for, for regulatory approval and then switch it later on um, and so that that might seem very rare and I think it is rare but um, some of you may remember this case um, so this was uh, the Volkswagen um, emissions scandal in 2015. So the US Environmental Protection Agency found that Volkswagen had violated the Clean Air Act by intentionally programming the car's diesel engine software to only activate the emissions controls during testing conditions. Um, and so when the car was out of testing conditions, these emissions controls were removed and the car had, a, had much higher emissions. Um, and this went undetected for several years. Um, and this is a tactic that is kind of um, uh, incredibly devious. Uh, it's kind of su suggestive, also uh, reminds you of, you know, the kind of techniques that malware uh, writers might use. So behaving kind of innocently when you're under the microscope of a regulator, but then misbehaving out in the wild. And this, this kind of practice has been called software doping. Um, there are similar examples, for instance, in uh, uh, benchmarking for performance of smartphones. So um, quite some years ago, Samsung um, was dusted for, for sort of overclocking their system in the benchmark testing. Um, some of you might remember this example from Uber. So this is slightly different. Uber's Grable program. So this was a program uh, from Uber, which essentially tried to detect whether an Uber user was actually a government official that was trying to investigate uh, whether Uber was violating various uh, regulations uh, around uh, you know, uh, vehicles and use of taxis and so on. And so when Uber's system detected that a user might be a government uh, investigator, it switched the normal operation of the Uber app for a different app, which made it very hard for the, for the government official to actually observe any of the practices that were going on that might have indicated um, violations of, of the law. Um, so while I don't think these practices are necessarily widespread, um, and I would hope that in most cases uh, regulators can take the evidence that they get from uh, regulators at face value, um, I, you know, I think it's worth remembering that these, these examples exist. Um, I asked a friend who works in financial services regulation about, you know, how does it work in that context, and they said that this kind of thing would be very unlikely in that context. Um, having a regulator approve a model, then secretly substituting it for another one, uh, the consequences would be so monumental that it's extremely unlikely, especially under the regulatory regimes such as in the UK, where senior managers and directors would be held directly responsible. So if, we want to, if you want to prevent this kind of thing, um, strong regulatory penalties uh, that, that uh, involve individual liability um, should be a sort of important part of, of how we stop this. Um, that said, we might be wondering whether there's anything that could be done in addition uh, to prevent this at a technical level. Um, and there are some interesting suggestions. So um, uh, some of the technologies I mentioned earlier for data model and version control, uh, verification, decision provenance are likely to be helpful here. Um, and they're also kind of, you can augment them with cryptographic methods, um, which basically do things like verify that a certain uh, output it is the output from a particular model and not uh, an, a substituted model. So um, in Kilbertus uh, uh, and, and co-authors in, in 2018, they outline a model for decision verification. So you can uh, address the situation where a malicious modeler uh, has a model approved. In this case, they were considering uh, fairness uh, uh, um, assessment. Um, then they switched that model out for a different model in practice. They're looking at ways to um, verify that that hasn't happened. Um, similarly, um, uh, projects like Trillion. Um, Trillion is a means of storing data in a way that makes it possible to verify if anything in the underlying data set has changed or been deleted. Um, so some of these, these technologies could be useful if we want to add a technical mechanism on top of the uh, liability mechanisms that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, but I think, you know, generally speaking, that that kind of problem hopefully is not one that is going to be plaguing regulators in future, but there are mechanisms to, to address it. Um, and in fact, some of these, these systems, as I said, are already in widespread use. Uh, 
Um, some of you may be thinking, well, could the blockchain be useful here? And that's almost always, uh, the answer is almost always no. Uh, but I think in this case, it's not totally stupid. Some of the technologies I mentioned are already using blockchains. They don't call it the blockchain because they're invented before Bitcoin. Um, but this is a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree is basically the same as a blockchain. Um, and it's the data structure that underlies the most common version control system. So there are already, to a certain extent, some of the mechanisms that you might need to verify you know, what version of software was running at a certain time. Um, so I've talked a lot about regulation of algorithms, um, the resources, skills, and tools that regulators might need to regulate algorithms. Some of them are simple, immediate, and urgent. Um, so the resources in question. Some of them are perhaps a bit more far off and fanciful. So the questions about uh, software doping and how we could verify that, those are kind of perhaps more fanciful and, and far off into the future questions. Um, but now I want to turn to the other part of this talk, which is about the use of algorithms for regulation. Um, so the use of ML and other technologies for regulatory compliance has been part of this emerging space of regulatory technology or reg tech for a few years now. Um, this is typically marketed to regulatees as a means of achieving compliance. So it typically assists with compliance tasks that are associated with things in the financial services sector, like know your customer, anti-money laundering, records checks, and so on. Um, so an example from an anonymous uh, reg tech vendor, uh, they say, we've built the world's first AI and machine learning powered database of individuals, organizations, and associated entities that pose a financial crime risk. So technologies like that are being used to um, uh, ensure that firms are not uh, dealing with um, you know, potentially uh, criminal uh, customers. Um, other forms of reg tech use technologies like voice recognition, natural language processing to detect uh, risk factors in regulation related conversations. So for instance, if a bank is interacting or transacting with a customer, that conversation is being recorded and automatically scanned by a, a natural language processing model, which aims to flag up that the customer might have not have been properly informed about something or they might have been missold some service. Um, there are also systems which, um, which propose to automatically assess regulatory compliance against machine readable laws. So this is something that's been explored under the, uh, the idea of rules as code. And so organizations would deploy these systems internally and use them to assess their own regulatory compliance. There are less exciting, perhaps, but perhaps more important applications, things like automating document discovery um, and so on. Um, and we've seen these kinds of tools, um, tools for estimating compliance risk, um, tools for, uh, for identifying regulation related conversations and so on. Uh, they've been designed and marketed at firms who need to be compliant, but these are tools that are designed for the regulatee, not for the regulator. Um, so what would it look like if we tried to apply some of these ideas um, to uh, empower the regulators to do their jobs? So what would it look like to have reg tech for regulators? Um, so the rise of, of reg tech hasn't gone unnoticed by these regulators, uh, and many of them are now exploring how they could use algorithms to make their own work more effective and more efficient. Uh, this is a particular concern for those regulators whose remit and responsibilities have expanded um, in a way that's not in line with their resources. Um, so, you know, um, those regulators who need to, to take on, um, you know, many more um, smaller firms as a result of expansion of regulation. Um, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK uh, used to have 250,000 large and medium sized firms that it had to regulate. Now it supervises an additional 30,000 smaller firms. So, when there's a large mass of regulated entities that need to be proactively monitored, it might be that regulators turn to algorithms to do things like this. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, they might look at uh, things like statistical tools um, in the same way that firms use um, anomaly detection to uh, do things like know your customer and anti-money laundering um, fraud risk. Uh, regulators could use techniques like this to identify firms that they supervise, which are outliers. They could use risk scoring methods to filter 
uh, triage, prioritize uh, high risk regulated entities and subject them to deeper investigation. Um, so this sort of algorithmic prioritization of regulated caseloads would influence decisions about the selection of cases to investigate, what cases to bring to enforcement, et cetera. Um, so it could be used to do also kind of targeted engagement, education campaigns, um, so that those smaller firms who may be well-intentioned but have less capacity can be sent automated tailored advice, for instance. Um, there are also opportunities um, for regulators to use some of the tools that computer scientists have been deploying for many years now to automatically detect behaviors of websites and apps at scale. So this would enable the regulator to scan millions of sites and web, uh, websites and mobile apps and do things like automatically detect whether there are third party ad tech companies um, that are tracking users. This is uh, research I've done in the past. They could look at whether the cookie uh, consent notices that are being used on websites are compliant and they can investigate that at scale. Um, they could look at dark patterns. So this is work um, recently um, done, which is automatically detecting when dark patterns were being used on e-commerce sites. So for instance, to uh, trick users into thinking that the item they wanted to buy was about to run out um, in order to sort of encourage them to, to make the sale um, or to do um, price discrimination and so on. Um, so these kinds of studies are, are you know, they're hard to do. Um, because many of these sites have a means to detect when they're being visited by automated bots rather than real web users. So regulators would face challenges in trying to disguise their, their bot, uh, their robot uh, puppet armies um, as regular consumers. But there's certainly you know, lots of opportunities they could deploy in this context. Um, so reg tech for regulators, these approaches all uh, would have an effect on uh, who and what gets regulated and how. Um, I think they do have some potential, but they also raise a number of concerns. So first, I think, uh, first concern is that we need to be realistic about the limitations of these technologies. Um, despite the hype and marketing around them, many of them just don't work as they are claimed to work. Second, I think we should be aware that even when they do work, they work at a scale and at a volume, which regulators with finite capacity may not be able to keep up with. So when I started my PhD about a decade ago, I was very excited by the idea that we could use open data to detect potential regulatory violations. Um, so I obtained uh, the register of data controllers from several of the national data protection supervisors of EU countries. Um, and these data sets contained uh, records of hundreds of thousands of data controllers uh, and information about you know, what kinds of data they process for what purposes and so on. Um, so I set about looking for combinations of features in the data set which might indicate potentially non-compliant practices uh, using health data for credit risk scoring, for example. Um, so the number of potentially non-compliant entities I found was a very small percentage of the data set, but it was a very large data set. So that was still hundreds of organizations, too many for a regulator to actually follow up on using their current, uh, their current resources. So my first lesson was that sometimes uh, scale doesn't scale. If you're looking for needles in a haystack, you need to actually have the capacity to investigate the needles that you find. Um, third, I think we should leave room for unusual cases, cases that set important precedents, cases where strategic litigation affects long-term change. These things still need to be pursued. Um, and this means we need to trust that the considered judgment of experienced personnel working at regulators may not have the statistics to back up their case, but they can spot an important problem when they see one and they can investigate it. Algorithms can't tell us what the underlying normative rationale of the law is. Um, so just as Sandra explained in her earlier talk, we can't always formally define and automate the application of normative concepts like fairness. Um, tools may act as uh, evidence that help us, um, but human interpretation is still necessary. Fourth, these systems will find things that happen to be easier to detect doesn't mean they're finding the things that, that are most important to detect. They don't rank firms uh, neatly in sort of order of non-compliance. So if regulators are going to rely on them for prioritization of casework, it's not necessarily going to be the most fair process. Um, and you might be less concerned about the human rights and justice of um, private regulated entry entities um, who were potentially algorithmically ranked in an unfair way by 
a regulator's algorithm. And I'm not saying that I personally would stay awake at night worrying about them. Uh, I don't think the regulator is going to turn into a sort of algorithmic leviathan uh, wielding a sort of sword of enforcement on one hand and the, uh, the crozier of algorithms on the other. Um, but I think as public authorities, um, regulators, sorry, that was that slide. I think as public authorities, regulators do need to act in accordance with the regulatory remit, their, their uh, requirements of procedural fairness. And so one concern about the use of algorithms by regulators is um, that they may undermine the procedural fairness of their enforcement action. So leading to appeals by the regulatees seeking to challenge the use of algorithms by regulators on grounds of procedural impropriety. Um, I don't know what it's like in Germany, but um, in the UK, judicial review of regulators under administrative law is quite a common thing. Um, so regulators who do this kind of thing, use, use AI to regulate, are going to have to worry about what we might call um, procedural impropriety, if you'll forgive my small pun. Um, so I would be fascinated to see uh, big tech companies' lawyers argue against the use of algorithms to make decisions about them. Um, I'm sure they'd be able to make compelling cases, and I'm sure they'd be able to carefully avoid drawing their own practices into question. Um, but it is right that the exercise of regulatory power should be held to standards. Um, it's important to note here, though, that many of the activities of a regulator would not be um, at risk of this kind of uh, accusation of procedural impropriety. Um, if you're using algorithms to monitor a market and gather intelligence about the market in general, fact finding, evidence gathering, uh, to target engagement, to support organizations to comply with the law better, um, those things are unlikely to be, to be challenged or challengeable. So the risks will really only be in the cases of using algorithms to actually decide who and when to enforce. Um, so um, I want to finish by discussing um, some alternative models of algorithm regulation. So at the beginning, I discussed this sort of standard model, um, and that's a kind of simplification, but there are actually a, a range of different things we could do. Um, and so um, I think some of these different models of, of algorithm regulation blur this boundary that I've drawn, um, perhaps slightly artificially, between algorithms for regulation and regulation of algorithms. So I'll give you a sense of what I mean by this. The, um, in, so this is the standard model that I introduced earlier. Regulator issues code guidance rules. Regulatees implement them in their own contexts um, use on the models that they have developed themselves. Um, but there's a different model that's deployed in uh, prudential risk regulation. So this is, uh, this is typically uh, regulation that's undertaken by central banks. In the UK, the Prudential Regulation Authority sits within the Bank of England. Um, and essentially, financial services and insurance firms are required to hold a certain amount of capital and liquidity to keep their prudential risk within certain limits. Uh, and so they use a model to determine these limits. And the regulator actually produces a standard model that's uh, used to calculate the required capital holdings. The regulatees are expected to use this standard model um, and so this is a way that the regulator actually writes the algorithms that regulate, that the, that the regulatees deploy in their own context. Uh, if the regulatees don't like the standard model, they can actually, uh, they, they're allowed to change that. Uh, they're allowed to develop their own internal model. Um, but in order to do so, they need to uh, seek regulatory approval. And so this is a kind of triage model where uh, if the regulatee is happy to use a standard model, that can be managed that way. But if there are certain change, you know, certain context-dependent differences that mean that they want to have their own model, they can do so, but they need to go through an additional approval process. Um, so I think in some ways, you know, this could be an interesting model to pursue for regulation of algorithms. Um, maybe for certain high-risk uh, contexts, and this mirrors the uh, the GDPRs. Uh, risk stratification around data protection impact assessments. Um, the regulatory process is triaged through a set of procedures that involve regulatory approval for high risk cases. Um, and if you, if you want to use a standard model that's defined for your sector, you can do so, but if you want to change that, you have to seek regulatory approval. 
So I think this kind of blurs the distinction between regulation of algorithms and regulation with algorithms or via algorithms, because it's a collaborative process of uh, determining what algorithms are going to be used in, in different sectors. Uh, and it, it's, it's one that has been used in a limited context of prudential risk, but it'd be interesting to see how you could adapt this to um, other uh, areas of regulation, particularly around uh, regulation of algorithms. So I think, uh, I think that's my time uh, up. So I'll finish there um, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.